features Claire Vane from, is the CEO of Integrated Resources, and Nikita Mikhailov, who is a, who's from uh, psychology at work. Uh, their talk is Making Perfect Teams from Imperfect Human Beings Using Psychometrics. Uh, and that's going to begin by well, going to hand over to Claire. So Claire, do you want to take it away? Thank you. I'll do proper introductions after I've played, but we have a perfect team here. We have Tanya, who is going to do the slides and all the technology and handle two cameras, heaven help her. Nikita, myself, and we have the piano. We have four members in the team. So we're going to try and make a perfect team by bringing different things to the party. So the focus is, as Jerry said, making the perfect or near perfect team out of a variety of human beings. Of course, none of us is perfect. Well, maybe some of us are. Anyway, music is like a team. And Jerry said to me, I want this evening to be different. So I'm going to play the piano. Why? Well, music is like a team. It has components. It has very disparate parts and they all come together as a whole. So I'm going to play a little at the beginning and then speak and then hand over to Nikita and play some more when he gives me the cue at the end. And I've deliberately chosen two contrasting personalities. And even within music and personality, there are many, many traits. And we'll be looking at 144 traits this evening. I'm going to play some Rachmaninoff. Now, Rachmaninoff was an enormously tall man. He had a growth disorder. And I'm going to play you a prelude in G minor, which is very famous, which you probably know. And it was premiered by Rachmaninoff himself in Moscow. And you can actually hear him playing it on YouTube. Might be quite interesting. Rachmaninoff was very tall and he had colossal hands. He had a 13 note stretch. And those of you who can play the piano or play a stringed instrument will know that a 13 note piano stretch is enormous. Most women pianists have a nine note stretch. So Rachmaninoff had a span this much bigger than my span. Of course, if we want to rep measure Rachmaninoff, we get a tape measure and we get a bust of him and we put the measure around his waist and up his height and across his hands and we know how big it is. Of course, we don't have a tape measure with personality. We have to use something else and that's where we bring in psychometrics. So this piece, Opus 23, number five by Rachmaninoff, has three personalities and then sub-traits. Military precision is the name of the game. Quite quiet. And then this military precision becomes very noisy. The personality overextends. Nikita will explain this. Then in the middle, it disappears and we get this yearning lyricism. Completely different. The polar opposite of the first guy. And then we get a sinister, mysterious, slow interlude. And then Mr. Military comes back again. So I'm going to play you this Rachmaninoff in a moment. We're using two cameras. So Tanya will move from me to the keyboard and then back to me afterwards. At the end, I'll play you something soothing and romantic. A Mendelssohn song without words. Very different personality to leave you to drift off into the rest of your evening. I hope you enjoy it all. Thank you. 
Sorry, Claire, I just, can, can we just unmute for a second and just give that the appreciation and just a, a nice little loud, loud clap. I'm sorry, Jerry, I'm taking over here. Okay. <laughs> Nothing quite like Zoom applause, is there? <laughs> well done. Can everybody mute again, please? <laughs> Tanya, might I have the first slide, the very colorful one, please? Can you switch cameras? Thank you. Are we? Right. Great. Thank you. So the representation here is that we all bring different strengths to the table. Let's not talk about development areas, which of course is the modern parlance for weaknesses. We don't say that. And the trick is to make a team out of the most effective combination that are grouped together and then they make almost a perfect whole. So tonight, we, helped by Nikita, whom I'm going to introduce in a moment, will look at what traits matter, why they matter in the workplace, and how they can be used for complementarity rather than conflict. You may feel in a board meeting you'd like to hit the chief exec. It's never a very good idea. It results in going for gross misconduct. But sometimes you feel that way, and it's a matter of keeping the best traits to the fore so that they're all utilised and conflict is kept to a minimum. So my name's Claire Vane. I run a business called Integrated Resources. We're a team of 11 HR consultants and coincidentally, I don't quite know how it happened, we're all women. And I don't understand also how we're now in our 20th year. It seems to be very quickly that this has passed. We work for a lot of household names, pop stars you would know and want tickets for. Um, I can't oblige, to small businesses and medium-sized enterprises. And all our work, whatever it's about, is about releasing potential. 
so not usually potential on the piano, but whether it's employment law, the use of psychometrics, the use of leadership development, the use of coaching, it's about pressing those magic buttons and letting people go, releasing the team and releasing the energy. And we also know from a wide variety of research that um, happy employees are more productive. I can point you in the direction of various surveys if you want to know. So I'd also like to introduce my uh, colleague and friend Nikita Mikhailov. We met several years at a bar in London in a comedy club about to listen to my elder son do stand-up comedy. And there is no one better to talk about the power of psychometrics and to make a perfect, if not near perfect team from different kinds of people. He's also, sorry to embarrass you, Nikita, one of the most self-aware people I know. Now we've all been under huge pressure. Some of us are more aware of it than others. People behave badly, they behave well under pressure, but we're seeing extensions of behavior overextensions, which Nikita will explain. I think the stakes have become higher, leaders have become polarised, good ones are few and far between, and I think I've heard some of you who are here tonight talking about the lack of statesmanship within our government. I better not dwell on that for long. But leaders are being polarised, the bad ones are very bad and the good ones are very good. And my proposition is that when we recruit, that's one of the things we do, and when we retain, we shouldn't be just thinking about the individuals, we should be thinking about the perfect complement in the team. And recruitment and retention policies are about the team, not just the individual. So might I go to slide three, please? And the next one, please. Here in front of you is a spectrum of change management. If we spend a load of money on our employees to give them a technical competency they haven't already got, we spend a lot of money. And if there isn't a behavioural change, what's the point in doing it? If somebody decides to go for psychoanalysis, we have a psychoanalyst here tonight, he or she is looking at what triggers certain behaviours, but they, people go to psychoanalysis, decide to embark on psychotherapy, do some counselling, do some coaching, because they want to make a change. So bringing about behavioural change is critical to human resource management, but it's actually critical to every line manager. I don't think we spend enough time thinking about the most appropriate interventions for the right circumstances. But we had, don't have Rachmaninoff here at a six foot eight or six foot 10, and we haven't got a tape measure. So let's have a little look at behavior. If we're going to make changes in behavior, we have to do it individually and collectively, and we have to use the right intervention. And as you see, as you go to the right from the left, the interventions become more and more directive, more and more prescriptive. There's something else that human beings don't like. They don't like confrontation. They don't like giving negative feedback. Most of us like to be liked. So we need a language and psychometric profiling, if you're using the right tools, can give you a language. Now, I think it's worth just asking ourselves what the difference is between a group and a team. A group is a random group of people. We are actually a random group of people, but we have some team in us, don't we? Because we're all interested in business in Cambridge. So we decided to join the um, Cambridge 100. I also know the food's very good at Jesus College. So that does help as well. And everybody's very welcoming. And if we want a team instead of a group, we have a common purpose. We should be all heading in the same direction. So if we want everybody to head in the same direction, we need to know what the component parts are made up of in a lot more detail than we usually do. And only then, when we add the vision of the leader and understand what our achievable outcomes are individually and collectively, do we have a recipe for making a team work. Now, I don't really recommend that you read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People because it is deadly boring. 
But the seven habits are really excellent. And my favorite is know your outcome. So if you're going to know your outcome, where your team's going, what you want it to do, where it's starting from, where it's going to end up, you don't start out on a journey unless you know where you're going. Of course, unless it's Barnard Castle, but uh, we know about that. And only will you achieve your dreams organisationally or personally if you know where you're going. So outcome is important. The team is important. Knowing your outcome, knowing your journey. And the other thing that's very important, Tanya, could I see the next slide, please? Is the area of values. And this may sound like a very bold statement, but it's actually true if we take it by degree. Our values drive our behaviours because everything we believe in drive our thoughts, our feelings and our beliefs. And in turn, that drives our behaviour. So a values model, understanding what every piece of the jigsaw is in terms of values when you recruit them, retain them, promote them, get rid of them, make them redundant. Very important because then you can motivate them appropriately. An organisation too has values, whether it's a Cambridge college, a high tech business, a law firm, an accountancy firm. All of them have values. Some are articulated, some are not. Some have strap lines. You know it's good for you is one, for example. That's not the same thing as a value. So our values in an organisation underpin the strategy and drive the day to day operations. And it doesn't take a genius to work out that in order to make that work well, there has to be congruence between the individual and the organisation. So if you've got a three foot bed, don't hire out man enough in a shift role. So when we're recruiting to a, to a role, we should be bearing in mind the values, the team composition uh, and the destination. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the problem solving cycle, which will gradually lead into Nikita's piece. Can we have the next slide, please, Tanya? So this is the problem solving cycle. It's something we do thousands of times a day. and We do it automatically and we don't always realise we're doing it. For example, if you get up in the morning and you decide you're having breakfast or not having breakfast, you will go through the problem solving cycle. Then you have to decide what you're going to wear. It's jolly cold out there, so you need to wear something. And if it were not lockdown, you would have a wide range of options. Shall I wear the red flowered dress? I look out of the window, certainly not. It's not suitable to present to the Cambridge 100 and it's damn cold. Shall I wear jeans? Mm, don't think Jerry will be very pleased. He'll tell me I could have done better. Don't wear jeans. So what we do is, and we do this with a complex issue, a strategy, uh, a difficult mission, a project, consider the options. We then evaluate. And when we've evaluated the options, we then make a decision. We then implement the decision. So I decided I'm going to wear a dress tonight. This is the most extraordinary thing in lockdown, a dress. I've almost forgotten how to put one on. Which dress? Well, they're all black, so I wear a black dress. Do I want long sleeves? Yes. Do I need frilly sleeves? No, I've got to play the piano. Must have tight sleeves. Right. Am I going to be too hot in that or too cold in that? So I choose the dress. I decide it's all right. I put it on and I've implemented my decision. And then I look in the mirror and I evaluate, is this going to irritate my wrists when I've got to play the piano? No, that's the only evaluation I wanted to do. I then decided I needed to wear shoes. Yes, really nice shoes, not slippers or lockdown shoes. So we go and get the shoes. And whatever you're doing, you are embarking on a problem solving cycle but you won't necessarily be good at all of it. For example, Cambridge is full of bridge playing mathematicians. They are fantastic evaluators. I'm generalizing to make the point. I'm not a great bridge player. I get terribly bored. So if you have a room full of evaluators, nothing gets done because they're busy evaluating. If you have a room full of Nikita and me, we'll be bouncing off the ceilings 
and the evaluators will be missing, a room full of Nikitas and me will get so excited and so creative and make thousands of decisions and implement them and end up exhausted. So that's no good either. We need a bit of everything. Can I have the next slide, please, Tanya? So we are going to look at traits in some detail and Nikita will take us through this. There are not psychometric tests that we're talking about, they're profiles. There are two kinds of tools. There are psychometric profiling tools. There are a great many on the market. There are also ability tests and they test for certain technical competencies. And it's very important to use the right tools at the right time. The tool we're going to talk about is called Lumina Spark, and you will have come across loads of tools. Uh, Hogan, Belbin, OPQ, Myers-Briggs is the most popular, Thomas, International. These are terms you all know. But since using Lumina Spark about eight or nine years ago, I've abandoned all the other profiling tools because this gives us far more data, far more reach, both how somebody is underneath how they operate day to day and how they behave when they overextend and the pressure's on. So if we're going to build teams effectively, our proposition to you is you need to use a tape measure equivalent. And this is the one we're proposing. And if I could have the last slide before Nikita speaks, please, Tanya. I was asking my practice manager who's listening tonight to prepare the slides and I was interested as I slotted this slide of Nikita's in. No one sees the world like you do and I grew up in a vicarage in Manchester with my father banging on all the time. Nobody sees the world except you through your own eyes. Everybody sees the world through their own eyes. So when I saw this I thought, yeah, we hear it even in psychometrics. And with that, I hand over to the Chief Neuroticism Officer of SciPub, Nikita. Thank you, Claire, for such a wonderful introduction. And thank you, everybody, for having me and for me to have an opportunity to share my obsession with you, which is psychometrics and personality. So I've been doing this for about 10 years. And if you're wondering how obsessed I am with this stuff, I profiled my fiance with two psychometrics before proposing. And because she's lovely. Well, yes, because profiling, because like living it to one assessment for such high consequence selection decision is purely irresponsible. Now, if you think that's bad, then I met with my mentor, Wendy, in the pub because us psychologists were an alcoholics club, the psychology problem, let's be honest. And uh, we're drinking and she goes, what's going on? And I go, Wendy, I think I met the one. And she goes, Ooh, what's her name? And I go, Olga. She goes, show me Olga. So I take out her Neo personality profile, I'll give it to Wendy. Wendy looks over it and she goes, mm, yeah, mate, you totally lost it. I meant a picture. But I'm like, but that's how I see her. Um, and to me, the way I use personality assessments, I use them as part of one-to-one -one work, um, be it coaching, development, teamwork. And I also pair up with a therapist and we use it as part of couples therapy and we work as a duo. And I can attest what they say about marriage is true. It is psychological. One is usually the psycho, the other one's usually the logical. So it complements nicely. As long as everybody's clear on who's who, it works fine. So the key thing is, to me, personality assessments is a really good tool uh, and language to use. Whichever assessment you use, if it works for you, great. Because to me, when we talk about personality, we don't really know what we're talking about. And it sounds a little bit confusing because it's one of the most researched fields in psychology. You have tens of thousands of peer reviewed articles, everything from genetics to what have you about personality. But what we're trying to describe, we don't know. It's a phenomenon of individual differences. So to me, it's like this uh, picture of blindfolded people touching an elephant and you know one touching the trunk and it's soft and so on one touching the tail and it's fluffy one touching the foot and it's hard but they're touching the same elephant but they can't see it so whether you work with eq trait type value tools dark side it's all the same elephant so whatever works for you but we needed to pick a model so, uh, so we picked spark can everybody see my screen with the spark model on it 
Perfect. I have one thumbs up. It's a representative sample, so I'll go with that. Uh, perfect. So, first of all, one needs to know how come some psychometrics came about. So, for example, the personality model of DISC originated by a guy called Marston, who also created the Wonder Woman and the Polygraph. And he believes the true aspiration of a man was to be lovingly dominated by a woman. So he's a very interesting character. And uh, you have other psychometric models as well. So if you're going to be using a tool, what's really important, you get to understand why and by whom it was created, because it's usually created by one or two people. And it's important to know the origins. So this assessment was created in 2009 by a guy called Stuart Dessen. Got the history of statistics, and knowledge of personality. So he based it on what's called a big five model of personality. If you want to get geeky, I suggest you check it out. It's based on the analysis of the English language. And he created this model by sending out his questionnaire across Japan, Canada, UK, US, and several other places, because he wanted a cross-cultural sample to begin with, because Lumina was launched in Japan, Canada, and UK at the same time. So it needs to be cross-cultural. And the way the model works, it's really simple. There is 144 items you answer, which measures the 24 qualities on the outside. And let's say if you're highly sociable, statistically, you're least likely to be observing. And if you're highly sociable, you're more likely to be radical and demonstrative. So the principle of the model is qualities are positioned next to their statistical neighbors and opposite their statistical opposites. Because they're individually measured, some people can be both. It's just not statistically likely. And when we take assessments and your results, we norm them. Actually, the norming process makes it a psychometric rather than just a personality assessment. So we compare your results to people who've done this before. And um, the way it works is then you get a percentile score. It's how you compare to the population. So one time I had somebody who scored 99th percentile on structure and 99th percentile on flexible. So top 1% of population on both. So how does this work? And he says, well, Nick, it's simple. I don't know what you ask. I keep very detailed agendas and diaries and that's structured, but I keep them in pencil and that's flexible. <laughs> and to him, it was perfectly fine. He, he literally didn't understand why I was asking. What came up to him is that he was really frustrated that everybody else didn't have that. So, why some people were just structured and some people were just flexible. Why couldn't people be both? And that's what I find often. Most people have a paradox in their personality, something that's quite unique to them. And they might take it for granted. It's the same in everybody else. So when they get their performance reviews and let's say if they're highly outcome focused and people focused, so focused on task, but also taking people with them. And in the review, it will say really good in leading the team to a task, but keeping everybody on board. And she might go, or he isn't everybody and miss that. <laughs> so, but he might or she get frustrated when other people are not like them. So if you get frustrated with somebody, ask yourself, <laughs> A, is it a recurrent pattern? And B, is it maybe a strength about yourself, which is quite unique to you, that you're not owning and it shows up as frustration because that's also quite fun. And then we take 24 qualities and we make them into eight aspects. So, for example, we have sociable, demonstrative, take charge, makes up extroversion, observing, measured, intimate, makes up introversion. So we measure extroversion and introversion separately because some psychometric tools, when you score low on extroversion, it go, aha, you're an introvert. So they treat introversion as absence of extroversion. But with us, we measure it separately. And the key thing is most of us are a combination of both. We're ambiverts. So... There's extroversion, introversion, and ambiversion, but strangely, ambiversion got forgotten. And there's misconceptions between the two. I always say an introvert is an extrovert with good taste. So they're more selective of what they're extroverted about. Uh, you know, if you get an introvert speaking about the topic which they find interesting, they'll talk at you more than an extrovert. That's just anecdotal evidence. And it's just important to measure both sides of the coin and value both sides of the coin. Because quite often we value one or the other, and that's where it can get a little bit problematic. But we'll get onto that later. So you have the 24 qualities, eight aspects, and like four color motifs running through the model, which is quite nice. And you can map onto it, you know, uh, type-based tool.
tools, big five base tools, etc. Because it's all the same elephant. This is just a different take on this. And here's, for example, my personality profile and a little bit of narcissism, which we already covered. Uh, but what I'm curious about because personality is a very interesting word. It's like stress or leadership. We think it's fantastically objective, but it's interesting to get other people's perspective on this. And for this, we'll be using a platform called Menti. Feel free to use it or not use it. And if you go to menti.com and type in this code, 69567444, that number again is 69567444, and just type in what words would you use if you could not use the word personality? Just anything that comes to mind, really. Or if you feel like not using Menti, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, nice, I can hear the rain outside. Mine's just a bit frozen, Nikita. I'm, 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 I'm in there. I know these silences on Zoom can seem very long. Look, there we go. <laughs> well, somebody started with self characteristics, behaviors, and as a high extrovert, I always count to ten after asking any questions. Really good tip, because my default setting is any questions good. Moving on, and people don't seem to ask me questions. It's weird. So if you're highly extroverted. So any questions, count to 10 inside your head. On Zoom, 20 seconds. So it can feel so long. Um, so we can see quite a few. What makes me, me, perfect. Type, traits, self, identity. There's a lot coming through. And that's the key thing. When we talk about personality, we all mean slightly different things by it. Because like, for example, the amount of times I was brought in to do a workshop because we have a strong personality within a team. It's like, what do you exactly mean by strong personality? Or we're looking for a certain kind of personality for this team. It's always interesting to get a little bit under the bonnet. And um, in practice, whenever, it doesn't matter what psychometrics people completed, whenever I sit down with them, I would always ask how would they describe themselves first before we open up the report? Because this self-construct is so essential. Mm, perfect. Desire, hmm, interesting. Charisma, that's also, so we can see already concept of self, but also how other people perceive you coming through. Interesting take. That's an interesting ringtone. Um, so there's quite a few different things. So from my perspective, With personality, there's pretty much like three main levels. There's preference or trait. Preference trait is what you like, is what we're naturally predisposed to. There's also behavior. What do you do? Probably misspelled. And maladaptive, what you do too much or the stress response. And there's also things like self-management, EQ, and how other people see you. But from my perspective, it's easier to think of personality, what we like, what we do, what we do too much. And this is, for example, something reflected in Spark. We ask you items of what you like, what you do, what you do too much, so we can see to what extent what you like and what you do. Oh, because for me, for example, whatever psychometric I use, one of my favorite questions is, if you couldn't use, um, no, what aspects of your personality do you consciously manage at work? And why do you think it's necessary to do so? And in thousands of sessions, everybody had an answer. Nobody said, I don't manage anything about me. I would be actually quite worried about that person. Because we all manage something about ourselves and it's perfectly healthy. Because humans are ridiculously adaptable as humans. I mean, just look at the last year. Look how we adapted as a species. We are going through a species-wide event. We haven't went through a species-wide event. I don't know if that's even a term, but it sounds legit. Uh, since we were like a little tribe all the hundred thousands of years before. And everybody is having a subjective experience. And uh, we managed to adopt going from, if I'm on good terms with my boss, I'll work one day from home a week, 
to you work in five days at home and don't you dare show up to the office like that. And we adapted, we, it didn't fall through. And that's amazing. We went through, if you saw somebody in a face mask, rubbing their hands incessantly with hand gel before and after they went to the shop, you'd probably think they have OCD. If some, somebody doesn't wipe their hands with gel and has a mask on when they go to the shop, now we treat them as a threat to society. So the key thing is we went through a lot of adaptation and that's a major example, but we all adapt our behavior based on the people we see and their personalities. When we want to meet them halfway, it all takes effort. So this degree of adaptability is perfectly normal. And I still think you're authentic because you're, you're the one doing the adapting. So as we move on, mm -mm -mm -mm, and if technology works, and for some reason, right. So quick reminder, nobody is perfect. So one of the key things which is essential to building a team from imperfect human beings is to realize how others might sometimes misread you, especially under stress. So the way that Spark does this, we look at the everyday, which is your behavior and overextend it, what you do too much. So for example, if you're highly logical, especially under stress, people who are highly empathetic might perceive you as argumentative. So they might go, you're being argumentative. And you go, no, I'm not. Or people who are highly logical might see people who are highly empathetic as emotionally stretched. Now, what we mean by this is that people who score low on empathy, it doesn't mean they're not empathetic. They're just really selective of the in-group they're a part of. So close friends, close family, close colleagues, like up to 10 to 12 people, roughly speaking. And to them, they'll move mountains for. But everybody outside this group, well, I don't need to have an emotional bond with them to be productive. So there's a clear separation between in and out. But people who are highly empathetic treat almost everybody like they're part of the in-group, which is a real mystery to the people high on logical. Because like, why do, you, why, do, why do you care so much? They're not your family. They genuinely mean that because they can't fathom why do you care so much about them? So that's the emotionally stretched bit. And what's really important here to remember is that that's just a viewpoint. Like I was working with an IT team and the head of the team was like almost one percentile on empathy and 99th percentile on logical. I needed to check his ears that he wasn't a Vulcan. And uh, what turns out is that what happened, he says, this results are wrong. I'm empathetic. And everybody around him said, he's the most empathetic boss we ever had. So he explains this group between in-group and out-group. And he says, yep, that checks out. And the person next to him went, John, that's really mean. He really turns around and says, you're part of the in-group, what are you worried about? So it's that differentiation. And why is it important? Because some things get in the way of leveraging diversity of personality and thought. And this is called confirmation bias. We all have a bias to seek out information which is in line with our perspective. So let's say a situation where somebody high on outcome focus said something that upset the person high on people focus. And the person high on outcome focus know they're in the wrong. But instead of pairing up <laughs> with that person high on people focus the next day and saying, can you understand, can you help me understand what happened? What's more likely to happen, they're likely to get a drink with another outcome focused person and go to the pub. And in Canary Wharf, there's a lovely old bar one when we could go to the pub under the Reuters sign and you could hear the conversation play out. Same conversation, different format. I wasn't too harsh, was I? No, they need to learn. Or if they think they have it bad, they have no idea how we had it in our 20s. So that's the person high on outcome focus getting a drink with another fellow person high on outcome focus. And they put the world to right, but they still need to work with the high on people focus. What they don't know is that in another pub, Somebody high on people focus is having a drink also with somebody high on people focus and saying, that guys we work with, I mean, seriously, how can we stand them? So it's be very careful of who do you go to talk to when you fall out with your opposite, both in relationships and in work life. And this is one of my favorite questions is what did you just hear? So 
if you're presenting or talking to somebody and their reaction is quite different from what you thought they should be reacting ask them what are they hearing right now and it might be really interesting what's coming across it might not be what you're intending to but it's better to address it then than go to the pub and confirm what you think they're thinking and another key thing was let's say was high extroversion don't perceive introversion as rejection because that's what often comes across because if you're highly extroverted and you're presenting and the person had an introversion said there was a poker face you might be going oh they don't like my idea but actually they might be just thinking so there's little misconceptions that can happen and in spark we show this that let's say somebody how an extroversion can be perceived by an introvert as overbearing and introversion can be perceived as serious and withdrawn and why is this important is that all personality traits have a value and all of them can be overdone and all of them can be misinterpreted and this is something that i feel gets missed sometimes in popular application of psychology such as for example some models which get into the market like growth and fixed mindset they imply that there is something good and something bad. And in psychology, there's always a depends. And so to me, I always say, look, gross mindset is fantastic. But also, I rename fixed mindset as nurture. So you have growth on this side, all about bigger picture, inspiration, outcome. And on the other side, you have the more nurturing qualities. So people on this side are more comfortable with innovation. People on this side are more comfortable with implementation. And you need both for something to manifest. And I feel that absolutely, if you overdo this, this side can freeze over and become fixed. But same, you can overdo growth and become chaos. So to me, whenever I bring a personality model within a team or any applied psychology model, there's need to be good sides to both sides and both sides need to be overdone. Well, not need to be, but can be. So therefore, if you will be working with creating perfect teams, whatever framework you will be using, I would suggest use a balanced one which respects all sides of behavior and underlines respect. Because ultimately, when I look back at high-performing teams I worked with, and by high-performing, being productive at work and also have a life outside of work, uh, it's and it usually is one of the key ingredients is respect towards your opposite. Because if you don't respect it, it's hard to work with them. I had teams of founders who burned through their funding because they were both high on big picture and extroversion. They went through their runway so fast because they had no respect towards this because they saw this as corporate, something they broke free from. So it's very important that both sides are respected, both in development and selection. So any questions so far? I thought your comment about extroverts performing, mm -hmm. such as tonight, mm -hmm. online, when mm -hmm. you don't get the feedback you want in real life, I personally, as an extrovert, find that very difficult because I'm not picking up the signals, the sounds, the words, the whispering, the cues. So I found it very interesting you articulate that. I must also apologize for my maladaptive phone who decided to sing in the middle of Mentimeter for some reason. It's perfectly okay. we got a nice tune as well going. So, yes, and it's just very important to value all the different traits and being aware that they can be overdone and sometimes people can misread us. Nikita, can I ask you a question? Sure. The chart you've got there at the moment, the everyday and the extended, if you take, if you measured that a year ago, or perhaps a little longer than a year ago, and you did it today for a lot of people, would it be the same or would it, are there areas where you'd expect to have changed dramatically, particularly when you think that People a lot more empathetic. Certainly, CEOs tend have to be empathetic these days because the teams won't follow them. That everybody's been through too much stress. Do you think they say the same? Are they changeable or are they fixed? That's such a good question. So the key thing here is that with psychometrics, is there first of all soft numbers. So when you think of measurement, we always think of like weight and a set number. So it's like set units of measurement. But psychometric numbers are squishy and they're Mal malleable uh, and some people are more malleable than others uh, so some people change more than others and the thing is, is there's a common misconception that personality is fixed actually the british psychological society advises you to complete psychometrics every two years 
So not to use results which are older than two years because personality assessments are actually designed to take a snapshot of your personality in time. And there is level of stability, of course, but there's also level of flexibility. And personality is a dynamic entity because it depends on our circumstances and what we do. The research right now uh, is fascinating on changes of personality. So one of the key traits which really gone up, which is not directly measured in Spark, one of the big five, it's called neuroticism. So it's anxiety, anger, hostility, neurosis. I mean, it's in the name. And people have become more neurotic. That's across the board. But neuroticism is a very interesting trait because it's not that valued in our society. If you go to France, it's highly more valued in France than it is in UK. Here it's stiff up a leap, lip. In France, it's like, je suis neurotique, pourquoi pas? It even sounds better. But anyways, uh, but not making generalizations, but it's more accepted. But the key thing with neuroticism, it's one of the essential ingredients for empathy. So, because if you're not neurotic, what are you empathizing to? And I saw this in a couple of managers. So I had one manager who was really low on neuroticism, like bottom fifth percentile and really high extroversion. So he was a really positive guy, highly resilient, all of those things. And I asked him, how do you deal with your more emotional colleagues? And he said, it's why? So simple, Nikita, I, I tell them two things. And I go, ooh, words of wisdom. What are they? I, so when they come to me with their emotions, I tell them nobody died and they should grow up. And I was like, nice. And if this doesn't work, ah, I send them to HR. <laughs> and right, so neuroticism is not a trait we looked in our CEOs. And I would be fascinated, for example, to see neuroticism data on world leaders, company leaders, and see how they reacted and how quickly they closed the borders. Because people high on neuroticism are more risk aware. So a person, if you tell somebody what's the risk, person high on low on neuroticism will say, one in a thousand. A highly neurotic person will say 50-50, it will either go wrong or it won't and it probably will. So they're a bit more cautious, put it this way. But I think because this neuroticism is going up in the populace and in CEOs as well, uh, I think this is the fuel for empathy. Because if we can turn this into post-traumatic growth through adding meaning, etc., and reflecting on our common humanity, I think that actually maybe a bit more neuroticism is what CEOs need to start feeling empathetic. Because what we know also from research is that the areas of your brain, which seem to be like, we know so little about the brain. This is, you know, this is like very basic. So the areas which seem to have be associated with empathy uh, seem to become more silent the more people you're responsible for. So it's almost the further you go up the chain, the less empathetic you become. So if you don't start with a lot of empathy, you're gonna have zilge by the end of it. But then again, if you run the company with 50,000 people, if you're empathetic to all of them, it's a bit problematic. Uh, so therefore, I think that this experience can be really transformative for what leadership is and for leaders themselves. And one of the key things we're seeing is a major, is considerable personality change. Is that there's a magical six months for some weird reason, nobody knows. If you're in a situation for six months, a strong situation and a bit stressful, your personality starts to change. Your um, state becomes your trait, as we say. And we've been in this for 12 months. So the people who left the office, even if we used to, look, if we all get vaccinated tonight, develop antibodies and come back to workplace two weeks from now, to the same office we left a year ago. We're different people now. And that's one of the key things to realize. And this is what the workplace is really struggling with, to treat people as individuals, because I talk to workplace experts and all this, and you know, they refer to humans as occupancy density. They literally refer to people like that. How dehumanized can you get? And they need to go from occupancy density to treating everybody as an individual. That's a major step we're right now making. And CEOs need to see themselves as individuals and the people that they're being experienced as individuals. But as Carl Jung said that seeing people more as, I'm paraphrasing this after three coffees, but basically cultures go through culture shifts when they see people more as individuals. And I think right now is a major opportunity 
for people to see themselves and others more as individuals and have more basic empathy to themselves and others. But I don't know if that answers your question or was that the opportunity to go on a yeah. rant? Yeah, I think we'd like to see, don't we? Because um, unless I think CEOs develop this, this empathy that, that they won't realize the success that they're gonna get out of their teams. So yeah. I've asked about yeah. 20 or 30 clients in front of us at any one time. And I see an incredible polarization that the very empathetic are becoming more so overextending in that empathy and failing to confront issues within the business. Mm -hmm. And then there are the others who are incredibly outcome focused and actually can't do the empathy, are becoming even more so very overextended, quite cold hearted. And because they lack that empathy, they can't see it. So it's going to take uh, what Freud would call an encounter with the real to get them to shift. So I think you see both extremes. What we do see in the workplace at the moment, a lot of very high level, high profile grievances at senior level. So the behavior of the, the, the principal within a business is rocking the boat and causing a lot of fallout. Tensions are running high across the board. Question from Kathy Curley. Kathy, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, uh, I was just wondering in terms of your personality, your traits, your behaviours, are those actually hardwired in your DNA from birth or are they actually affected by your parents, your siblings? So is it nature or nurture determined? It's both. <laughs> That's the thing. It's nature <laughs> and nurture and the interaction between the two, which is fascinating. Okay. I thought that was probably going to be your answer, but it, does one ever particularly dominate or is it is it literally just a spectrum of uh, differences that you see in different people of what really determines the person they are today? I um, read a wonderful book some years ago, Kathy, by Matt Ridley called Nature or Nurture. Um, and I had very strong views prior to eight years of psychoanalysis and now I have very strong views in reverse. And I think a uh, lot of things are very are hardwired and you have to make a very conscious revolutionary decision to make a change but that's an opinion not a a rule certainly um, i always remember my my mother she's passed away now but she she could see my sister and i obviously we all came out of the same gene pool uh with differences but just right from the word go, we were very different in our personalities of who was more thinking and structured, who indeed was more artistic. So, she, you know, she said she could see that almost from a few months old, should we say. So just that's what's the interest I have in that sort of question of uh, what determines your, your, the way you are now, nature or nurture. So thank but you. If you have two children you might well have one with 49% different genes from the combination that the other one has. So they can be so polarized. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, my analyst saying to me one day, but you're a different mother because the child is different. And I said, but I'm the same mother. He said, no, you're not because you respond. And so a circle gets set up. So it is nature, it is nurture, it's influences, it's people, it's the effect the other person has on you and that voice on your shoulder. That's what, great. You only have one? Sorry, say again, Nikita? Uh, I was just saying to Claire, what, you only have one? one I have like several. And you know, it's more powerful, <laughs> maybe have a few more. Yeah. A question from Jill Westwood. Do you want to unmute Jill and ask your question? Oh, yeah. Hi. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I hadn't seen this model before. Um, I, so I lead a team that uh, we're, we, we have many common values. We're all, uh, we're creative teams, so we'll have different uh, creative disciplines and skills. And uh, we work in a very large organisation. We work with many other different teams who um, don't, don't always <laughs> Um, have the same traits. So some of them will be very, uh, you know, very logical and and tough. Some of them will be completely disorganised and so on. Um, I'm really, I'm really keen. So we have, uh, we we form quite a tight team, and I do try and counter any sort of us against them kind of culture. 
but I just wondered whether you had any thoughts of how to really, really get, really, um, really get that to be a, a, an everyday way of thinking for them, because I, I don't want them to lose that closeness. I don't want them to, you know, not value each other and what they do, but I, I think it's really important they understand the differences with, with other people. Mm. Yes, the us versus them. So we want the closeness and belonging to our team, but not at odds with the other one because we're still part of the same organization. Am exactly. I, sure? <laughs> I think, Jill, you can start off by uh, doing a values exercise as part of a workshop and establish what the differences are for starters. And then um, Nikita and our team have done some work together where there was a lot of friction at board level and we did psychometrics on all the members and then ran various exercises to increase the overlap and neutralize some of the dissonance. Mm -hmm. So I think you can improve it if the component parts are prepared to listen and make some choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from my side, um, there's a few things you can try. So I have dealt with teams like that, especially right now, for example, um, there's a few teams, especially who are high big picture and inspiration driven, who adapted really well to change. Mm. Value discipline driven and, you know, conscientiousness and grit. But those people don't really adapt well to change because they need predictability in their environment. So they like to keep things the same. Mm -hmm. And um, but the distance has grown a bit. And what I do even with teams like this, I just basically ask them to note what really gets on their nerves as far as the overextensions. And if there's too much overlap between the members. So I was working with one team who just pretty much despised everything to do with down to earth. The, all, like all the crosses on annotate were there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we discovered actually why they hated this is because those people were asking all the questions they didn't prepare for in meetings and making them look bad. <laughs> yeah, I recognize that. <laughs> and the thing is, they were like, well, if we hate the detail because it triggers us, maybe we can invite them a bit sooner to participate with us. Yeah. Like, let's invite your arch enemy in the meeting and get them a coffee and their input ahead of time rather than at the presentation. Like, we really value your input because what we reframe to them is that you, the critics of your idea also care about your idea. That's why they're criticizing it. They just have the wrong instructions. And what I often find is that What's really interesting is the really high big picture thinkers who really score low on down to earth also think they're logical, but it's their own logic. Mm. Mm. So their logic can jump. Let's say when they present, they can go A, D, C, X. Any questions? Good, moving on. Because when they jump from A to D, their brain post rationalizes. It's clear there's B and C between A and D. I don't need to say it. Mm. The people who really are in the detail come out and it's like, I couldn't follow him after he missed B. Yeah, I know, <laughs> because it's just like, shoo, went really quickly. And therefore we just sit down and we talk about these differences and what each side can bring. And even the littlest things can matter. Like if your teams meet, when do they do this? So one time I had a really diverse team who, who met on Friday, 4 p.m. And they were at each other's throats. Now they meet on Tuesday, 11 a.m. They're not the best team ever, but they're not as bad as they were before. And yeah. even little things like this or meeting etiquette. So if you have a real polarization, have a part of the meetings that is all what is. So what's happening with the financials? Are we on track? And then have a part what if. Mm -hmm. So each side has time to shine. And most importantly, at the end of the meeting, for everybody to go around the table and say what exactly they're going to do between now and the next touch point and yeah. what they'd appreciate some help with. Because otherwise, each side might think they're on the same page, but they might not be just because of that difference of perspectives. Thank you, that, that's really, that's so useful. Thank you very much, Nikita. I so recognized a lot of that. And um, I think the, the inviting uh, the people, it sounds counterintuitive, inviting the people that are um, rubbing various people up the wrong way to get them involved early in the collaboration because that's what we do we need to 
and we do collaborate right across the organization. I think that's brilliant. Thank you so much. That's really and helpful. There's also a really good cartoon by the New Yorker. It's uh, two chess pieces in a restaurant, the knight and the pawn. And the pawn goes to the knight. Well, I got here, but your directions made no sense. So. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Thank you. Uh, the key to Claire. We've got a question now from David Bartlett. David, can you uh, unmute and ask your question, please? Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks for that, Claire and Nikita. That was fascinating. Um, I I know the Orbo one in Canary Wharf quite well, Nikita. So I um, haven't been there for a while, though. Obviously, um, one of the things that um, I, we keep coming up against is um, how, how do you maintain um, group and team morale um, in the current environment when people haven't seen each other physically for months, best part of a year now? Um, it, it feels like as as a leader, you're far more involved in people's lives even though you don't see them um, at the moment and so sort of, it's a bit of a conundrum how to maintain that um, morale when um, everything seems a bit grim at times. Uh, we could probably both answer that. I, I can only comment on my own team in detail. I think there are a whole number of interventions you can do but what a lot of leaders are doing is they're particularly if they are more concerned uh, with not, not being ex outrageous extroverts, they're hiding behind COVID and they're becoming less communicative. And I personally find myself talking to every single member of the team every single day and discussing things I wouldn't normally discuss, like homeschooling. I feel more like I'm being a school governor at the time uh, than I am about running a team. So I've turned the volume up on communication and that's working. And the other thing I've learned I don't bring anybody into my team because there's only 11 of us. We're about to bring two more in. I will not bring somebody in who hasn't done a Luminous Spark because last year I brought somebody in who had already done Luminous Spark and didn't give me their, their profile for several days. I took her on. It lasted a week. She didn't fit. So I have learned a very severe lesson. I use this tool every time we're recruiting. And I know when somebody's going to become soppy about something so my team all over extend and become terribly terribly nice and people focus we're in the middle of a redundancy exercise and the client's saying get on with it and somebody's slowed down saying they're such a lovely person sorry that role the business doesn't need that role we've got to look after the health of the survivors because so many more people have their livelihoods dependent on it so i think if you use this tool okay, none of us is perfect again, but you can see people's hot spots. You can see what they're likely to do under pressure. And so either building an existing team or using this tool uh, when you're recruiting gives you a whole new set of data, which now I've come to rely on. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. And from my side, I would just add, first of all, get some support yourself as a leader. So I had an um, opposite. So there was a leader responsible for a team of 50 and she had a call with each one of them about their mental health. And she was completely wiped. And I said, do you have any support? And she says, I have a coach. I was like, you need a therapist. Like uh, really, if you're gonna do such an exercise without supervision, I wouldn't even do it without supervision because it's like, seriously, first of all, make sure you have support. Two, um, I have a mate, Ron Warren. He, he's an interesting psychologist, teaches at Harvard and Yale. He says the role of a leader today is how to facilitate collective intelligence. Because it doesn't matter how smart or capable you are, the world is too complex and unpredictable for you to carry it all on your shoulders. So sharing the burden. So it's not necessarily for you to maintain the morale of the group, but for us as a group to maintain its morale. So even peer coaching, can be useful, even getting people together where they can vent this and come up with ideas. So you can literally pose this question and say, what are your thoughts? What we can try in the next months? Uh, any ideas? And then just trying it. Some people say, well, we can have a call while we walk. So everybody's on the headset while we walk in for half an hour. Somebody says, well, what if we do this? Or what if we do that? And then just trying it. And then in two weeks time, you can meet up and say, okay, let's reflect what worked, what didn't. But the main thing is to make sure you have that support. And another key thing, stress is a very interesting thing, especially when traumatic events happen. We're all impacted at different stages. 
So some of us might be really freaking out in the beginning. I remember standing on a like a road in Oxford, uh, just did a lecture at the business school, and like all my clients canceled within the last twenty four hours. I had no work. And I was like, wow, I'm really freaking out. And, uh, but after this, this was probably the low point, but some people just want to send the grip or the, you know, the homeschooling and some people get the most impacted after the whole thing is over. So maybe three, six months after we're all vaccinated and back to whatever normal is going to be, they might be completely floored emotionally and uh, therefore being aware of these differences. I, I find even a little steps like uh, letting everybody know of the EAP or, or any employee assistance you have available to the staff, but being very clear about confidentiality. How many sessions are free and included in the program before the employer is notified that there's something going on to approve for more sessions? Is it open to immediate family members? And just sending out a letter here, it's for you, but also if any of your colleagues might need it. Little steps like this can be helpful. There's also a really good guidance by the British Psychological Society. They created a mental health task force, a COVID task force. And they actually published a really nice several documents on how can you work more healthy from home from a psychological perspective. So if you type in COVID task for BPS and you will find that. So that can be quite useful for ideas. Uh, does that answer your question, David? Yeah, thank you. That's brilliant, Nikita. Thank you. And thank you, Claire, too. I think... Um... Uh, yes, it's been great tonight, so thank you. I think uh, there's a huge take-up. I've noticed for me personally, a big take-up of coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know I've got several friends who are therapists and, and they say they are really, really busy. And Cambridge is full of therapists and coach. And I think coaches, and I think that people, you know, that intervention spectrum I put up earlier on, mm -hmm. people don't know what they're buying. They don't understand the difference. And I think... Um, bad buying is partly the responsibility of the coach or the therapist. And sometimes I see somebody and I say, you need a psychoanalyst, you need a psychotherapist. I might not tell them that immediately, but I might after two or three sessions. Sometimes they do both for different purposes. And if you are buying any of those interventions, then I think you need to look very carefully at how the coach or the therapist keeps themselves afloat and boundaried above all boundaries. And uh, I would recommend being really skeptical of mental health coaches. I think that kind of crosses the boundary. I think coaching is really good if you have a healthy ego strength, makes you more effective. And therapy is really good when people have low ego strengths. But mental health coaching is, uh, to me, an oxymoron, personally. It usually lets people get away with doing therapy without being registered. That's the way I see it. I think we're going to have to just wind up now on the questions. So can we hand over to Claire? Mm -hmm. Tanya, can we move to the piano? Yes, 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 yes. Just give me, I'm, I'm we're so fascinated by this conversation. Here we go. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to play you as promised something romantic and slushy and Schumann wrote of Mendelssohn's <laughs> without words who has not sometimes sat alone at twilight before his piano and unconsciously while improvising has not softly sung a quiet melody to himself provided one is above all a Mendelssohn and the one occasionally unites the melody to the accompaniment with the hands alone the finest Songs without words will be the result. And Schumann wrote that about Opus 30, uh, because Mendelssohn wrote a lot of songs without words. And I'm going to pay, play you number one from Opus 30. And I leave you to dream of, enjoy your evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nikita, for sharing the platform. And thank you, Tanya, for dealing with two cameras, a webcam, a mic, and the slides.
Can everybody like to unmute and give Claire and Nikita a big round of applause, please? For the extroverts. Tanya, could you put our my final slide up with our contact? Yes, yes, we'll do. Is that okay? Mm. Perfect. Over to you, Jerry. Okay, right. Well, that was fantastic, Claire and Nikita. I really enjoyed that. Um, so did we. And, it was, and the, added, the added bonus, of course, it wasn't just fascinating, but we had a piano in it as well, which I just thought was so soothing. Really, really nice. Um, just uh, for everybody to note that the slides are available. So if you email me, I can send you the set. Um, so uh, our next webinar is going to be on March the 18th and we'll send you details shortly. Uh, so thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I hope you found this, this, this webinar very interesting and um, good night and one last thing, just a big round of applause again for our speakers. <laughs>